Hello, everybody. This is Mike Nelson of the Mike Nelson Show. Make sure to subscribe uh, today if you haven't subscribed already. I want to thank everybody who's already subscribed around the world. Today, I got a well, a pretty cool guest uh, because uh, we actually share uh, the same uh, last name. I got Matt Nelson here of the band Nelson. How are you doing today, Matt? I'm doing great, Mike. It's uh, good to see you. I didn't see you at the family reunion last year, but we got to do something about that. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's not every day you get to interview somebody with the same uh, last name, so it's pretty cool. I want to thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, Melissa for reaching out to me to do this interview. Well, I never get to interview somebody that has the same monograms on their towels. So there you go. <laughs> there we go. All right. So tell me about, you know, I'm interested, of course, you know, me being a Nelson, why you eventually mm -hmm. decided to go with uh, Nelson uh, with your project there in the, in, you know, the late 80s, early 90s. Why did you, you decide to choose your name there for the project? Well, uh, we did a lot of things before that. You know, uh, we grew up in the L.A. area and kind of came up through the clubs in the late 70s and early 80s. So for us, it was Madame Wong's uh, West in Chinatown, Music Machine, uh, Blue Lagoon Saloon, and what's now the Viper Room. And those were our stomping grounds. And we had different names for the band. Like in high school, our band was called The Strange Agents. And then um, it went to The Nelsons. And then we basically had a band called Scarlet for a year and just decided that when it came down to it, naming a band is a tough thing. It's even tougher now because everybody calls themselves a producer or whatever, anybody that's got a laptop and everything is taken now. Even everything's taken is taken. So we, we were kind of at that position uh, when we had written all the songs that were wound up in the first Nelson album for Geffen. I, I'm nutshelling it because it was years. Uh, we just decided, screw it. Just call ourselves ourselves. The whole thing that we were trying to do was just be us. And that's what it became. It's just Nelson. Talk to me a little bit more about the projects you guys did uh, before that, because, of course, did different. You were, you know, can you give me a little more backstory about where, where we kind of all kicked off for you to get into the rock scene? Well, sure. Um, as I said, the, the interesting thing about us and no, not many people know, except your listeners do now, Gunner and I were kind of lumped into that whole Sunset Strip era hair band pop metal thing because it was an easy way to kind of market that type of music or anybody with long hair. It was like the Metal Edge magazine, Cream, all that stuff and, and Rip. Uh, but the truth was we predated all of that stuff by about 10 years. You know, we kind of came up where it was, you know, the LA bands were bands like X and Oingo Boingo and um, Fear, Black Flag, all those kind of things. And then all the, the rockabilly stuff like the Blasters and the clubs that we would play, uh, all the bands for a while had the, the word the in front of them. So it was like, you know, um, uh, uh, I guess the Knack was a big one, um, the Go-Go's, all that kind of that type of power pop stuff. So we were 12, 13, 14 years old in, in clubs. We were not old enough to walk in the front door of playing those clubs. We started playing, we were about, um, about six years old. Gunner played first, he uh, got a drum kit, and then I got a downsized Fender bass called a Music Master. Uh, I think my dad, who was a musician, and he was on the road a lot, uh, thought it was cute. You know, I'm gonna get the kids some instruments because they say they want them. He didn't realize that we weren't, we weren't really kind of playing around with it, no pun intended. It was not something that was a hobby for us. It was what we always wanted to do. And I think it's kind of, we had the, the one benefit of having somebody actually multiple generations in the family that were entertainers and could make it work when, you know, you'd have friends saying, why are you even trying? Because, you know, we had success that we could see on a daily basis. It's almost like, you know, probably being in the Manning family and wanting to get into football. It's like, we could see that it was, you know, what it took was actually even in music, it was really dedication and sacrifice and hard work when all of our friends were, you know, hanging out at parties or the beach or whatever. We were learning how to write songs and play. And I think that was because when we started, we started playing in clubs with people that were in their 20s and 30s. And frankly, nobody knows this, but those those kind of power pop guys in the L.A. scene back then, they were the gnarliest, most vicious people I've ever come across in the music business. They might have played jangle pop. But these were people with serious heroin addictions and they were they were mean. I mean, you get on stage and they they cut the cables on the back of your amps or, you know, break a tube or do all that. I mean, there was like sabotage and all that kind of crap that happened. They thought it was cute because they're messed up and it toughened us up. And uh, I think we got a little bit of respect because we were so young. Um, I, I, let's just say this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to go see the Foo Fighters. I'm friends with a couple of guys in the band and. It's been a long time. Uh, they Nirvana was on Geffen when we were uh, kind of replaced us, really. You know, that whole milieu kind of changed. But uh, what what was really surprising was Pat Smear, 
we were Gunnar and I were in the dressing room and talking to Dave and the guys were totally cool. And it was just us and them. And Pat Smear kind of waited for last. And he had that kind of sneer on his face. And he goes, hi, I'm Pat. I said, yeah, I know who you are, Pat. And he goes, yeah, I was in a band called The Germs. I said, I know The Germs, Matt. I, I, I know. And he said, yeah, but what you don't know is that you and your brother were playing with your band, The Strange Agents, in Chinatown at Wong's Chinatown. And across the alleyway was the punk club. It was Hong Kong Cafe. And all of us wanted to go over and see because we'd heard that you guys kicked ass and it was a really cool thing. But it wasn't cool for new waivers to hang out with punkers and vice versa. So we didn't do it. Wow. And he said, I just wanted you to know that, that I knew about your band. I was like, that just made my life. What a cool thing. You never know, <laughs> right? That's true. So yeah. talk to me about how that finally, like the Nelson Project, you guys, of course, uh, had a huge number one hit there on the debut album. Can you tell me about how that, when you guys were recording this uh, record, did you did you have a, like an idea that maybe this was going to work, you know, as, as big as it did? Or, or were you totally, you know, surprised by that success? Good question. Uh, we were we were surprised in the sense that we thought it would, pay, would probably take it was a different era. Right. And it was when people would go to record stores and they would buy a record. You have to drive down there, pay cash, buy a record, take it home. And uh, media wasn't what it is now. It wasn't um, it was kind of more, I think, kind of a prized thing. You'd take hard earned money down and do it. We thought it was going to take two or three albums. But we also knew a couple of things that we learned since uh, we were little kids, even watching our dad. Um, it's all about a hit song. And what we saw in LA was that there were an awful lot of bands that were working in, we thought backwards. And we had done that too in our earlier career. We, we knew how to play. We gave a great show. We could work an audience that was hostile and turn them around. All that stuff is really important. But even back then you realize that even if it was a band that was popular and got the good spot in the, in the showroom or the club, they had maybe one good song at the end that they had written, you know, one. And, we thought, well, what if we had an entire set of great songs and realized the hard way that nobody was going to give an up and coming artist that didn't have a huge record deal and a lot of money behind them. Nobody's going to give them their A-list material if we were talking about songwriters. So we had to learn how to do it ourselves. And we were kind of mentored by a, a great producer named John Boylan. If you look him up, his name is on uh, a lot of records. Uh, the bands he worked with were like uh, Till Tuesday. He produced the first and second Boston albums with Tom Schultz. Uh, Little River Band was a good one. Edie Brickell. I mean, he was he he's on a lot of things. If you want, he actually put the Eagles together to back up Linda Ronstadt. I wow. mean, if you're gonna have a mentor, he was a, the best one, and he was really the guy that kind of sat us down. And it was really after our dad died because we spent about a year just trying to find ourselves personally and get over the grief of that. You never get over it. It's just that the, uh, the sting becomes an ache. Uh, but he kind of sat us down. He said, guys, I think you're, uh, you need a little bit of advice. You guys have all the gear, you know what you're doing on all the other stuff, but you, you either have a hit song or you need one and you need to learn how to write. And so why don't you just take the time? You can travel a little bit, work with other writers and learn the craft of songwriting. And it was like starting all over again. That's when Gunner came off the drums because Gunner was a very well-known Los Angeles drummer. And he was a, like a kid drummer wunderkind, you know? And he, we actually did, um, we're the only unsigned artist to, to play Saturday Night Live as a musical guest. We had booked it actually after the, the booking agent for the show at the time had seen us at a club in Los Angeles. And he thought, oh, it's really cute. And they're, they're young and they're good and let's do it. Uh, and then our father died and we decided to to still do the show. And we were kind of an emotional mess. And it was a, a big deal. You know, Saturday Night Live is a live show when it was actually funny. And everybody watched it. And we did that show. and We did fine. We did. We did a good job. And it was on the plane ride home when Gunner turned to me and said, hey, man, I'm a mess. I'm, I'm miserable and I'm going to blow your mind right now. I know we just played the biggest show you can play. And it's not right. It doesn't feel good to me. I don't like the attention we're getting for the wrong reasons. So I've decided that I want to come up front with you. That's what's missing. And I need to learn how to play guitar. Now, for a guy that didn't know a thing about playing a note of guitar, uh, and I was a bass player too. So we were a rhythm section for that drummer, that awesome drummer. Still haven't played with a better drummer than him. Um, and it's that's ironic He because he, he doesn't play drums anymore. He's a guitarist. He's a really good one. He told me he was going to spend every day for a year learning how to play the guitar. He, he said, my, my logic is that most people say they play guitar. I've been playing guitar for six years, but they're lucky if they spend 10 minutes on it a week. He said, I'm going to play all, you know, and he started really getting into it. I, of course, flipped out, thought he was nuts, but he pulled it off. 
And in the time in that process, we were starting to learn how to write. So it all kind of came together. It was Gunner coming up front, which is really part of that look. Us working on a unique sound, as well as a good songs, which is the two brothers singing together. In all the club stuff, I was singing all of the lower lead vocal stuff, and Gunner was singing the harmonies. And we were in the studio making demos for what became the After the Rain record. When the song started coming in, we got a development deal with an A&R guy named John Kolodner at Geffen. And we got a tiny budget. It was like $200 a song to record the whole thing. And I was in the other room. I wasn't feeling so good. And Gunner said, hey, look, I don't want this to go to waste this time because of a different era again. You had to do everything in a real studio. He said, you mind if I go in and just try a vocal, the lead vocal on this song? And he did. And it was kind of like one of those, we all looked at each other and went, that's what, that's what was missing. All this time we had it reversed. And so I learned how to sing and arrange all the background vocals. So all the background vocals is me arranging them. And for the most part, I have a higher range. I can go lower and I can go higher, but Gunner's right in the middle. We call it the enchilada. He's got the enchilada. So he's right there. And then you get the sibling harmony. It's not even sibling harmony. It's twin brother harmony. It's a sound, it's a thing. And that's what we developed. It's It's got to be great songs and instantly recognizable with our vocal thing. And we built it really around what we wrote with, which was acoustic guitars. So it was kind of like that. It's almost like a heavy folk rock pop melange that didn't fit with anybody that was in that metal scene or whatever. We thought those guys were, you know, we just didn't get it. You know, I mean, I, I hung out with with a few of those people. I mean. I got to meet Brett Michaels before they broke and he was such a nice guy. And I heard the demo tape and I hate to say it. I was like, Ugh, okay, well, cool. <laughs> I mean, it was on cassette and lo and behold, you know, the next year that, you know, we used to ride motorcycles uh, together, Harleys and stuff. Great guy. And he, he took what he had, which was, we want to be the ultimate party band and built it into something. Gunnar and I did the same thing. It's like, we're, you know, we want to be like a hard rock version of the Everly brothers. Our and our guy, John Collotter, very famous guy said you guys are like a heavy, you know, a hard rock Hollies, a band called the Hollies from the 60s. Yeah. And, and it was cool because it just didn't fit with anything. It was different. And I think um, th there's more to it. But after that whole thing, it was, you know, Geffen was one of these labels that had at the time the biggest artists in the world. You wanted to be at Geffen Records where this A&R guy was. And we just basically auditioned for him over a period of like three years. Um, Kolodner uh, formed and, and signed. Well, he signed ACDC. Um, he re you know, the whole white snake thing, the, the white snake album, the one that would still of the night and all that kind of stuff. He put that together after the record was recorded with Keith Olsen. And, um, at the time he had Cher, Elton John, and they had three pow powerful A&R guys at the label. They had Tom Zutat, John Kolodner and Gary Gersh. Um, Guns N' Roses was with, I think, um, Gary Gersh, uh, Zutat had Motley Crue. Kolodner had White Snake and and us. We were just this baby thing. And he, oh, sorry, he reformed Aerosmith, a little band. Um, wow. So uh, we were this little baby band that was kind of a almost like a science project for John Kolodner. We never got beyond a couple hundred dollars for the demos. It got to a point where we had been courting that label for so long. Gunner and I were down to seventeen dollars in a joint bank account, and we were living out of the trunk of my car, kind of crashing our friends' houses. And we wrote our song love and affection in uh in a bedroom at our mother's house i was just kind of zoning out and i came up with that lick and gunner had a mic remember micro cassettes he had a micro cassette recorder and flipped out and we wrote this song uh with a friend of ours named mark tanner who had been an artist on electra but he was like he was a nobody writer nobody gave him any you know credit or anything like that really um and this kind of team formed around songs uh, gunner myself and mark tanner we had heard some of his songs in a publishing office and without, we just kind of kept coming back to this one guy and we made this, this demo. I, and I remember Gunner and I recorded this, the song love and affection. Um, and we, as again, we were broke, we were just broke ass and we were against the wall. And we had managers at the time that said, you know, you're going to screw up all this uh, negotiation we've been doing for years. Don't go in. And Kolodner wasn't the kind of guy you just went to the office. You had to make an appointment it was sometimes three weeks, a month out. And we were friendly with his secretary and we knew what his tells were. If he was in a good mood, he was wearing a white suit. If you ever saw the Aerosmith video for Dude Looks Like a Lady, he's the guy that yeah. turns around with the beard. That's John Kolodner. Okay? Wow. okay. So if he was if he's in a good mood, he wore John Len John Lennon white suits. If he was in a bad mood, he wore black or or blue. And, and it was like without fail. We would call 
his uh, secretary to ask him what he was wearing. And if he was wearing white, we'd go in. If not, it was like he could be just vicious, just brutal. Um, he knew what he was doing, though. He just had some weird thing. He was the kind of guy you would say, you'd say, there's something wrong with the chorus. And, well, John, what is it? What He's like, I don't know. You're the musician. You fix it. That's what we were left with. So we wow. kind of created it ourselves. But when we wrote the song, back to the point, we were completely broke. The managers we had at the time said, you're going to screw up everything if you go in there. And we just realized we had nothing to lose. And we called the secretary. He was wearing white. We said, we're coming in. We have a hit song. She said, but he's got a big day today. And we said, yeah, I know. We don't care. And we came in and we actually walked into his office, said, what are you doing here? You didn't make an appointment. We said, shut up and sit down. We got something for you. And we played Love and Affection live for him in his office. Wow. And he sat there kind of closing his eyes, rocking back and forth, tapping his tapping his finger on the desk. And when it was done, he looked up and he smiled and he said, I've been waiting for you guys to do something like that for three years. And also to have the balls to come into my office like you did. You're going to need that in this business. You know that. And he picked up the phone and did the proverbial, hey, the Nelson deal goes through. And that's how it happened with us there. The problem was then we got in line behind Aerosmith and doing their permanent vacation and pump album and White Snake, And like we were just completely lost. We finished the album by ourselves. Love and affection. We had to go back to the drawing board. We uh, we had a, another guy completely re-recorded with us, a guy named David Holman. He went on to do Bush and No Doubt. And we had worked with him on a song for Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure called Two Heads Are Better Than One, it became the title track of that, that album. But Kalodner wouldn't let us release it under Nelson because you know we hadn't released our album yet, so it's under Power Tool. Uh, we wrote that song with Dweezil Zappa. So we had that, that thing with uh, Holman, and he had this knack for mixing songs that just had this kind of, not not, not to say a machine, but pop impact. It was like rock songs of pop impact. I mean, I, I love what he did with Bush, and with no doubt, you know, that the Just a Girl was his mix. And nobody knew who he was. Yeah. So we had all these people we were working with that became big, big people. But at the time, we're kind of fairly unknown. Um, and he'd been in the business a long time. Anyways, it just kind of everything kind of came together at once, you know, to, to work. And the problem was when the album was scheduled to be released, you know, they did a single. They would always do a single and then release the album. Um, we were behind some heavy traffic. And at the very last minute they decided to start a new label called DGC, David Geffen Company, basically to kind of free up with a whole new marketing staff and everything because they had too many artists. And Gunnar and I thought it was instant death. You know, we're not on Geffen anymore. We're on DGC. We're on the farm club now, you know? And what really happened for us, what really broke us were two things. We had gone to music conventions. There's something called the Bobby Poe uh, radio convention, which I think they still do. And I think it was the R&R &R convention. There was something else, but Geffen didn't even give us any money to like have, they normally have like an artist suite for the label where you could come up and hobnob with people and say, hey, this is what we got going on. They didn't do any of that. We had to pay our own way there. And we we decided to open up our guitar case, our acoustic cases in the lobby by the elevators because everybody had to go up the elevators to get to the suite. So we would do like these mini concerts and tell them who we were and what we were doing. And I can't believe it, it actually worked. Um, cause all of those radio programmers, a couple of months later, when we delivered our single, remembered it was a cool hang and they started spinning it usually on the smaller stations. But what really broke us was they had a uh, call in television show called dial MTV at the time. And kids would actually, actually call on a real phone and, and vote for their favorite video. And we hosted it for one week when Daisy Fuentes wow. and their VJ was out of town. And by the end of the week, you know, Gunnar and I, we started off really green on Monday. By the end of the week, we, we owned the place. It was great. We had a lot of fun. Um, and since we knew music, we would talk about the bands because we knew about all the music and the bands. So because we're music fans and uh, we would play. I, you know, I was told not to, but I brought my acoustic and we would play and sing between the bumps. And nobody had they hadn't done like uh, MTV Unplugged yet or whatever. But we just, you know, infiltrate and double cross. Right. That was kind of our thing. And uh it worked because by Friday, they, they didn't tell us, but we actually announced the number one video in the country. And it was the day that our video debuted. It was the number one video in the country. Wow. It just exploded. And so going back to L.A., they had a place there called uh, the Sherman Oaks Galleria. I think they just bulldozed it or maybe it's there. I don't know. But at the time it was new. Uh, that's where we used to hang out and, you know, go to Macy's and get our underwear and socks, that kind of place. You know, so the week before. We went there to kind of gear up for our going out to MTV to do the thing. You know, I got some clothes or whatever and couldn't get anybody to help out and just the normal stuff, you know. 
And a week later, we had an in-store signing thing that was scheduled when we came back. It was kind of like a debut in-store. And I remember uh, we got there and the person with the record company met us at the back door. And so did, um, so did uh, I, I guess, the guy that ran a record store there. We were doing this in-store ad. And that's basically where kids come and you sign autographs or whatever. It's like Spinal Tap, the movie Spinal Tap. You know, sometimes their disaster yeah. becomes, <laughs> you know, kick this ass for man, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but they both looked really scared. And it was very bizarre. And we had the other guys from, from the band that we had hired with us. And uh, they took us up in an elevator and they said, you don't know what you're going to see. And I said, well, what's going on? And nobody would talk. And one of the dudes was really kind of like sweating and I said, come on, man, what's happening? You know, we had done some promo with other little stations. Nobody cared. We opened the door to the elevator on the third floor and it was this jet engine roar of young girls screaming for us. And I'm talking three layers of this mall just exploded. And, uh, we wound up having to, they, the, the cops came and shut down the in-store and it was wow. just like mind blowing. It's like one, one day, nobody gives a crap. And the next day it's boom, you know, and you can't go out in public because Gunnar and I kind of, we had the long hair and we looked alike and it was hard to miss us, you know? So uh, our lives were completely different from that point on. Uh, you know, I'm not shelling because there were a lot of struggles and lots of ups and downs, but we went from, from playing and doing promotion at small things and little little clubs to uh frankly arenas you know it was it was like the world's the world's longest overnight success but everything that we learned along the way really helped us for that i think it was helpful that our dad was a huge star too to kind of see that you know all that crap doesn't matter and you're still the same person no matter what happens and you know so i enjoyed it i was completely depleted after that whole run was over i didn't see my own house for 13 months you know, we were doing six and seven shows a week uh, that were two and a half hours long. I went from 160 pounds down to 117 pounds just from running around and, you know, no sleep and all that stuff. But I was young and it was fun. And I came home millions of dollars in debt because we had to pay for 35 guys on the on the tour and buses and all that. But we lived that dream. And uh, it was it was pretty awesome, actually. Uh, it's it's definitely book worthy. Uh, because things, everything changed. All of a sudden, things weren't as much fun anymore in the business, uh, you know, when that whole other era came in. And that was by design. I mean, MTV had a meeting and said, we're not doing anything that's not from Seattle or R&B or hip hop. And that's what we're doing. Everything else is done. So overnight, everybody, everybody was out of a job. And Gunnar and I became kind of like the bookends for that era. So we had to kind of, again, start from the bottom and rework our way back up. And here we are now. I'm talking to you from my home in Nashville, Tennessee, still loving music. And now we actually put Nelson back together again and are playing shows with it. That's right. You guys have a couple big shows, of course, uh, next week or in a couple weeks here in the L.A. area, right? We do. We're actually it's like home homecoming thing. It's like working with people at clubs that don't answer phone calls. It's really fun. We're playing at the, the coach house in agora that's going to be on saturday the 23rd on the 22nd when we get there sorry on friday we're playing uh near pomona it's another coach house and then um the last show is going to be in orange county um so no sorry i got canyon club in agora another canyon club near pomona on uh on the friday and the last show we play is sunday in orange county at the coach house we played there before too great little intimate thing but we decided to bring the full band on this one we decided that it's, you know, they're low dough dates. It's just like a club. You go in there. It smells like, you know, beer and desperation. And we're going to blow the places up. It's going to be really fun. And people can expect to hear all the, you know, the, the, the songs from the first album. Or what are people going to hear in this on this tour? Primarily, when we put the set together on this, it kind of came about weird. We were asked to play and put the band together because last summer there were 16 shows that were booked with uh, bands like Lita Ford, Tesla, uh, Warrant, Winger, Slaughter, um, Great White, all these bands from that era, Firehouse, all friends of ours, all that we knew. But again, we had kind of stayed away from it for a while. And because we just wanted it to be as cool as it was back in 1990, 91, with, with the full headlining tour, we just didn't want to mess around with it. And we did other things. But we got a phone call that a guy in a band called Steelheart, Millie's great singer, he, he had to have heart surgery. 
And all of these shows were basically open if we wanted to take them. However, we couldn't just throw something together. It had to be truly legit, like the best players, the best songs, you know, that we had, uh, scenery, merchandise, whole thing. And we had two and a half weeks to do it. And Gunnar and I love a challenge. And we took it as like, well, maybe uh, the clouds are parting and, you know, God wants us to do this. I don't know. But we we did it. We had a, we put together. We always Nelson's always had a great band. Uh, we put together an amazing band, Neil Zaz on lead guitar, um, JJ Ferris. We stole the drummer from Richie Blackmore's band. And we went out there and, and two and a half weeks later, we started playing um, the sheds, you know, the the one the, the 10,000 seat outdoor stuff. We went on an earlier time slot, but we looked at it just kind of like uh, rebuilding that uh, that brand. And it was a great summer. Uh, it worked out great. And the thing was, we we had no idea how people were going to, I guess, perceive us kind of coming back out there with those types of bands after all this time. And it was just this unconditional acceptance and love. I think it's because anybody at this point in time that has survived is going to get a little bit of love. You know what I mean? Um, but the shows were fierce. The band is fierce. And that's kind of what it what it is for us. It's kind of like when we went out with Sticks in Frampton in 04 as an acoustic opener. Nobody knew we were on the tour. We were friends with the guys in Sticks, and we just did that. And, and it was, you know, 12, 15,000 people a night with two acoustic guitars in our voices. And and it kicked ass. It was great. I still have people saying it was it was great. We love a challenge. And the nice thing I can say is all this time later, you know, we're we still love what we do. We're definitely older but we can still hit the high notes and bring it. And we were 10 years younger than a lot of those people back then. And now it's been a real blessing because I don't, you know, I don't care who you are, you know, your voice is, this is a muscle, you're an athlete, you know? So to a certain degree, thank God we can still sing. And uh, I know there've been a lot of people that we've played with that uh, not on this last tour, but you know, through the years, I feel so bad for them. They've had multiple surgeries that they're just, you know, they're, you know, dropping the keys to the key of Z, all that kind of stuff. But, our show is it, what we put together is really heavy on the after the rain era stuff because I, I talked to Gunner about it. I said, listen, 10 million people had that album. You know, it's like they, they played from start to finish. And I think we should really load this set very heavy on those songs that they know. And I think it was a really good call. I mean, I've always thought it would be great to play the album start to finish, you know, from, from one yeah. side, you know, from needle drop to pulling it off. We might get there and do that. And I would probably do that almost as a, like a con with a concept video behind it or whatever. I think it'd be fun. I'm getting ahead of myself. Just if anybody comes to the shows in LA, they're going to get absolutely after the rain era Nelson. And it's, and it's really good. Cause I, I wouldn't say it, it's, I wouldn't tell you it was if it, unless it was, you know, this is the internet it gets around people know, <laughs> you know, is there any uh, new music uh, in, in the works after the tour? You guys are writing any songs, any, any oh. idea to record new music? The problem that we have is we record and write too much in, in all sincerity. What we've decided to do is we're going to probably be releasing a new, a new song at least every month, maybe every week. And I'm talking about really done well with guys like Ted Jensen mastering and Chris Lord algae mixing. I mean, it's, it's really good stuff. Um, we have, we have a couple of different things. We have, um, a band we put together called Firstborn Sons that didn't, you know, didn't fit with Nelson music it was maybe uh, edging a little bit more uh, roots rock and stuff. Uh, almost kind of like, who what would you say? Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, Walsh era Eagles meets Skinnerd. Okay. So like okay. real guitar heavy music like that. Uh, and that's all done. We have three albums already done mixed master. We just haven't released it because with all this nonsense, the last couple of years, it's kind of like, does a tree make a sound when it falls in the woods? We're just kind of figuring that out. So we decided we're just going to do it on our own, on, on our, our website, which we've just rebuilt. And it's going to be awesome. You know, we did have our own label that we started after our Geffen days because we were we were still signed to the label, but they wouldn't let us release anything for five years. And the pain of watching our audience just go away after all of that investment was too much. And I think we were one of the first, we were the first, some of the first artists that actually had an indie thing of ourselves. It was called Stone Canyon. I got the idea from my buddy Chips Enough from a band called Enough's Enough. You know, they were releasing their demos in, independently and we decided to do it. We went back and talked to all the people we'd met through the Geffen years and have been making music ever since. But we found that it's uh, it's always great to be writing songs. We have, um, I think we just did a deal with MC MCA Universal for our catalog, which is I think 17 albums now. Um, of course, the first wow. one that people got, uh, they 
uh, of course, that was the one that sold the most for whatever reasons, you know, that they were, uh, well, you can imagine, but we never stopped making music. And, you know, my brother, I've got to say, my brother's like on fire, you know, he's, he's writing so much now that it's, it's crazy. I've kind of taken a little bit step back. I actually, for a while there, I, I and I still have technically have the band, JJ Ferris, who's playing with Nelson. Now we put a band together called Red 37 and it's a three piece heavy rock thing you know um and we recorded at sound city dave Grohl made a, a movie about it and it was the kind of thing where we we did the album and mixed it in five days total and it's one of the best things i've ever done that's wow. going to come here too uh so we got a lot of new music coming up and the best way of of people finding out what we're doing is just go on nelsontwins.com i think you can buy tickets there the whole thing we're going to have our merch store up this week so it's nice to kind of embrace the fact that it's kind of a different era i mean we're old enough to have made music and 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 edited with a razor blade on actual analog tape you know and going through all the formats and wow. dat tape and cd you know cdrs i remember we used to go to the recording studio and they would charge you 200 dollars to burn you a cd you know back when wow. that was 200 bucks every time you want to take something home bucks. but you were bitching you had that cd man look i got a <laughs> cd um and now it's like you know, everything is, is so quick and so fast. And, and one thing I got to say, I'm old enough now to remember what it was like having a fan club. And we had at one time, we had uh, 70,000 active members of, of our fan club. You know, as I said, wow. for some reason, it really hit with the younger girls. And, and then Geffen jumped on board at, at the time and started putting us in all of those magazines. We never did interviews. We did interviews for, for Metal Edge. But I mean, like the Tiger Beats, the Teen Beats, all that stuff. I have no idea, but it was just easier for them. But what that did was, uh, you know, we had all of those those female fans that came to the shows. And as I said, it was it was great. It was like, you know, nobody could be the Beatles, but I understand a little bit what it felt like to get that sound coming at you, that energy. Things are a little different now. And uh, but I, I can say that I've, I've kind of navigated and gone through all the highs and lows. I saw my dad kind of go through, you know, because he was a huge star when he was younger. You know, it was him and Elvis were the biggest thing in the world, you know, and. It's just a matter of what I learned was it's how you get to not only navigate through your life and try to be congruent, and consistent. And I've realized that my mission is to try to be a good guy in a horrible, mean, ugly business, you know, and That's it's right. cut through. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, man, it's it's Cheryl Crow, I think, said something the other day. And I was like, wow, did she nail it? She said being in the in the music business for a long time is like is is the equivalent of being raped over and over again it's kind of what it feels like because right. you know they're stealing from you You know they're not going to pay you you know they're not accounting to you you know the less they pay you the the the, the 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 shorter the money is the worse they treat you it's really bizarre how that is but you know what it's still awesome because i still am that that guy that was 14 years old playing downstairs at wong's west just hoping that anybody would show up you know so i never lost that I think that's what it is. You just got to remember that, you know, you're still, you know, one song away from the best song you've ever written. And we, you know, it's like Gunnar and I came up with something four months ago that was just absolutely inspired and a song called Believe. And I just started writing this thing, just kind of started coming out of me. And uh, Gunnar was there and, and my friend JJ was there. And, uh, uh, oh, sorry, don't worry about that next second. Da, da, da. So um, I, I will say that... Uh, there you go. Got you back. Yeah. You're um, back. Yeah. Yeah. So this song happened and we've been recording it over the last couple of months because this song is so good that we decided that we needed a real orchestra on it. So we had a, a friend of ours uh, do a, a, an orchestra session, not not like keyboard strings, but like strings, you know, so we yeah, did that. Strings, on. Yeah. And uh, I'm a bass player and, and I've been playing my whole life and I I do sessions and and stuff. But every once in a while, you you just say, you know. I'm not the right guy for this because I really hear somebody who's not, I'm good at fretless bass, but I'm not a master of it, but I hear fretless bass on this. So we have a guy named Tony Levin, who's going to come in and play bass on that one. And if you ever heard like anything from Peter Gabriel's so album, um, yeah. you know, like don't give up, you know, that's him playing the bass on it. sledgehammer. He, he played. Yes, Don't, yeah. Don't. That's yeah. him. He's just, a, you know, I met him once. And Tony's we still touring with Peter Gabriel, right? He is. He's still yeah. playing with him. And I met him years ago when Gunnar and I were asked to do a tribute album to uh, first it was Queen and then it was 
um, uh, Van Halen, you know, when they would put kind of mini super groups and Tony was supposed to play that day and he, he was late. So I just threw a bass part on and I'm thinking, Oh, I'm a badass. And then Tony comes in and he plugs his, his music. He says, hi to everybody. Plugs his music man directly into the board and just wiped me off the planet. Just, it was all in his fingers. It's just like, man, that's Tony freaking Levin. I mean, I'm still a music fan. I'm still passionate about players and and the music that I grew up with and the music that I'm hearing is is so cool man it's like you know for 13 years I played uh bass on sessions with some people that got a guitar player named Tim Pierce he's kind of famous session guy and played with Rick Springfield when I was a kid on those really cool albums and great player has a great podcast and um who else was in it um well through the years it changed but uh there was a little known guitar player named Phil X who was playing with me. And, you know, Phil is one of my best buddies now. And we've done a lot of stuff together and we had a lot of laughs and he cracks me up. His family is funny as hell. And he used to kind of rip on, on me and Gunner because, you know, of our whole hairband past or whatever. And Phil has been in Bon Jovi now for 11 years. It's just awesome. Yep. You know, <laughs> I get to rip on but he's a genius musician. He's funny, but he's like from another planet. He sings great. You know, I just, I love talent like that. And I, I'm lucky to be able to say that I've, I've played music with him for a long time. You know, I'm, I'm honored to. And I love that kind of thing. I mean, after I get off the phone with you, I'm actually going to a vocal session. And not many people know this, but I, um, I did all the background vocals on the first two Steel Panther records. So wow. if, if you hear fat girls, that's me on the high notes. That's you. you know? That's me. <laughs> that's oh, awesome. Dang. My rock dog decided to say hello. This is Walter. <laughs> I do, Walter. Hey, Walter. <laughs> You're on camera again. Oh, thank you. All right. He's seen. He's like, well, what are you doing? You just keep talking at this light thing, you know? <laughs> he looks like well, everybody. Matt, I want to thank you. Thank you for coming on the show today. It was great talking to you. Mike, it's great talking to you, too. And uh, for anybody in the L.A. area, definitely hit us up. I got it completely, you know, all over the place but on the 22nd we're going to be out in uh at the uh the canyon club in, in near pomona come see that and then the next night we're going to be in agora in calabasas that place they're called uh the canyon club and the night after that we are going to uh we are going to be in uh orange county at the coach house so if you're into that hard rock thing you know i'll even give you a discount show up in your spandex it'll be fun we never wore spandex by the way but it was close well, I want to thank you, man. Thanks for watching, everybody. Remember to subscribe to the channel. Absolutely. I'm going to do that right now, actually, Mike. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good day, everybody. Take care.